Ah, nature. It's good to get back here every once in a while. Brings me back to my days in the Kit Scouts. What? Raccoon Cub Scouts, alright? Wait a minute. Do you even know what scouting is? No? Ah, that's alright. Sit here by this convenient campfire and pull out your miniature nature dictionary. Because today, we're talking about scouting. The story will continue after this. The practice of scouting is nothing new. I mean, it's changed since the military implementation of scouting in ancient times, but the practice of sending young people into the wilderness to learn things seems to be a universal idea for a lot of cultures. Just not on the scale the scout movement has made it. Scouts are, as a subculture, youth groups who learn informal education about a wide variety of things associated with wilderness survival. Historically speaking, there were Christian groups that matched the baseline image of modern scouts like Edinburgh's Boys Brigade in the 1880s. But the scouting movement we know today has only been around for a little over a century, with the Victorian era and British colonialism in southern Africa, where we would see the true beginnings of the scouting movement. Two men, one American and one British, would be the catalyst to a new kind of outdoor expeditions. Born in Sioux Territory in 1861, Frederick Russell Burnham was inspired by tales of Crockett, Boone, and the pioneers who pushed to live off of and tame a savage wilderness. Disappointingly, he was born in the wrong era. Coming of age in an America that only had frontiersmen and traveling shows, or on tombstones. It would be at the age of 32 that he would follow manifest destiny to what is now Zimbabwe, helping the British conquer lands from native groups for Cecil Rhodes' ambition to build a rail from Cairo to Cape Town. Under several expeditions against the Matabele, Burnham would prove himself to be an extremely competent scout. In fact, a chief of scouts, as he would be granted this title under Field Marshal Lord Roberts. After a brief prospecting career in Alaska during the late 19th century, he would be called back to South Africa to fight for Queen and Country. Months earlier, a friend of Burnham's would be caught in a predicament in South Africa. The Second Boer War, a conflict between Dutch South African republics and the British Empire. It would be in the northern town of Mafeking, King, under siege by Boers, that one man would help birth scouting. Lieutenant General Robert Baden Pohl, born in 1857 in London and raised in eastern England, would get a love for outdoorsy activities during his years at primary school in Surrey. At 19, baden Pohl would join the 13th Hussars in India, serving briefly in Afghanistan before being shipped with his regiment to South Africa. After proving himself to being mentioned in dispatches, baden Pohl would serve briefly as an intelligence officer under his uncle in Malta before returning to Africa a few years later. It would be during conflicts of the Matabele that baden Pohl would meet Burnham and become enamored with tales of the American Old West. This encounter would influence him for years to come. But let's catch up with what Robert's doing over at Maffa King. Not even 2,000 British troops were stationed in the city, surrounded by a Boer force four times their size. To quote famous Commonwealth poet Grant MacDonald, under siege, under lockdown. With such low numbers, and luckily before the siege had begun, baden Pohl's chief of staff, one Lord Edward Cecil, formed a cadet corps of preteen and teenage boys. The Maffa King Cadet Corps, as they would be called, served an auxiliary role to support the small force, relaying messages, hospital work, and anything else that was not a military duty related to fighting. Half a year later, thanks to various factors, a Boer attack on the city was repelled and the siege lifted. The Cadet Corps, with casualties and with merit, left an impression on baden Pool. Taking the nature of that corps and the frontiersman ideas of Burnham, he began to write and work towards a vision that would become the youth scouting movement. I should note that movements like the German Wandervogel would be popping up before baden Pohl sowed the seeds of modern scouting. Officially becoming more of a nature organization in 1901, the Wandervogel, or well, Wandervogel, Ausschuss für Schulefahrten, basically an organization for schoolboy nature trips, would be first as a hiking club under the efforts of one Karl Fischer. Over the next decade, this movement would have several groups splinter over the incorporation of alcohol and schoolboys. They also partook in a lot of anti-Semitism in their early years, but that's not what we're talking about yet. So let's see what's going on back in Blighty. In 1907, the Brownsie Island Scout Camp in Dorset would be the proving grounds for the scouting movement. In 1908, the first edition of Scouting for Boys was published by baden Pohl. Two years later, thanks to somewhat connected efforts by Burnham, Theodore Roosevelt, and newspaper magnate William D. Boyce, the Boy Scouts of America would be formed. 
Like a lot of scouting organizations that will be formed over the coming decades, the Americans use Baden Pole's baseline of scoutiness along with more American things like patriotism and various First Nation influences when it came to wilderness survival. There's a sort of universality to scouting, so unless another country does something interesting, we'll just cover what Robert's doing and scouting in general for the rest of the history portion. That same year, with a different Baden Pole, the Girl Guides would be formed. The predecessor to the modern Girl Scout, the Girl Guides movement was created by Agnes Baden Pole as a counterpart to her brother's movement. It should also be noted the first chief guide for the Girl Guides was the movement's co-founder, Olaf Baden Pole, Robert's wife. Anyway, the scouting movement would sweep the British Empire shortly after the works of the Baden Poles. Within the next two years, the Commonwealth and mainland European countries had their own respective scouting movements. Even more enticing was that the movements would continue to grow over the middle of the 20th century. So much so that just by the 1920s, there were international organizations such as the Boy Scouts International Bureau and the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts to better dictate the original mission of the Baden Poles and other scouting leaders. Depending on the country and the decade, scouting was seen as an underground movement. If you look at the years I am conveniently putting here for each country, you can make an educated guess as to why. Luckily, the world over would still have scouting groups pop up despite the changes in national management. Groups like the Young Pioneers from many communist states, the French E.E. de F, the Cookie Megacorp that is the American Girl Scouts, or any other group under the banners of WAGS, Wassum, or No Large Banner for the scout groups who like to be non-aligned. Throughout the latter half of the 20th century, the scouting movement steadied in growth with rises in urbanization and a want of getting back to nature in one way or another. We could see a slight shift in scouting schools as well. In newly independent and developing nations, the movement would work towards civic betterment rather than the bushcraft and woodworking of their American and European counterparts. But the ideas of civic duty and scoutiness persisted in every group that formed the world over, keeping the ideals of the movement from ever halting. Desegregation happened in many international organizations throughout the 50s and the remainder of the century. But in the 1970s, the Boy Scout Association of the UK would become open to all, dropping boy from its title. And while other groups in Europe and Asia beat them to it, the British Scouts did it slowly over the course of two decades. Into the new millennium, we would see scouting inch ever closer to its centenary, with nearly two to three entire generations being born into a world of the subculture. Contrary to the optimism of the last sentence, the scouting movement has seen shrinking memberships in many Boy Scout groups throughout the West. But there has been sizable and steady membership rates within Girl Guides, Co-Ed, and Asian and African groups. The BSA already has issues with memberships, thanks to a few barriers to entry I'll talk about later, as well as the Great Sick from 2020 helping drop their numbers by close to 60%. The American Girl Scouts have been doing better, but 2020 also saw drops in their numbers by about 29%. Across the pond, the OG Scouts in the UK still hold membership of over half a million in 2023. The movement has seen a rise in membership with both the Asia-Pacific region and Arabic and Sub-Saharan Africa holding the brunt of membership members from Wasm alone. WAGs didn't give me a lot of numbers, but there's a couple million there between the three regions as well. The movement has also maintained its place in popular culture since the middle of the 20th century, with mediums from literature to the big screen having them show up in one form or another. One could even say that both the ideas of the scouting movement and these appearances in popular culture have kept membership numbers steadily rising with new faces joining each year. So who exactly are these new faces? And you know what? I'm feeling good about this. Let's add in the old faces too. To put it simply, scouts are used usually between the ages of 10 to 18 years old, but can get as young as 8 if you factor in groups like the Cub Scouts or similar. That sounds a bit too simple for demographic analysis, I know, but this video is pretty long, especially when we factor in the BSA. After turning 18, most scouts will hang up their kerchief and sash of badges, but for a handful out there, they become mentors for the next generation. Scoutmasters, assistant scoutmasters, troop leaders, if it's a leadership position, there's a spot for those who are willing and able to take it. Working more like an older sibling or parent to younger scouts, rather than a commander or outright leader, Scoutmasters and troop leaders are tasked with teaching and guiding the next generation in the same activities they learned, as well as instilling the values set forth by Baden Pole. So why do scouts, both old and young, do this? Or, to put it in the language of simple English Wikipedia, why they do that? Baden Pole was going for an idea of what he dubbed scoutcraft, scoutcraft being wilderness survival, self-reliance, and extending the civic duty as well. 
The scouting movement originated as a way for a rapidly urbanized society to reconnect to nature in one way or two. It only makes sense that people would join whatever scouting organization their country has out of its interest in nature or even a desire to learn scout craft trades like woodworking or self-reliance. Along with these goals, they gained a little extra with the other aspects of scouting during their time in organizations. Baden Pohl digs more into it in the creation of the Scout Method, with ideas coming from the promises of learning by doing, spirituality or spiritual fulfillment, committing good deeds, and a variety of skills for personal improvement to name a few. The movement also, kind of loosely, ties into the escapist ideas the Western world loves to embrace. Think about it. As we've discussed on this channel before, the idea of reconnecting of nature and the idealized pioneer spirit of Baden Pohl and Burnham only exemplifies this. One could argue that scouting is a form of escapism, to go out of the industrialized society that exists around us in exchange for nature and a sense of communitas in the brush. Others are in scouts only because their parents made them do this to make friends. And look where it got me, mom. Youth scouts, much like a lot of youth activities, are meant to socialize children up to a certain age, along with the added benefit of teaching them skills that can be marketed to parents on top of them making friends. Teenage and older scouts are in the movement more out of a sense of communitas as well. And while they are more mentors or teachers in the program, they appreciate the role they have earned within the movement and still see it as a way to socialize with people, despite age differences spanning at most decades and at least a few years. But there are problems with dropping a bunch of children into wilderness survival situations. And not just through plane crashes or jumping out of flying buses. Discrimination has been an issue faced by the scouting movement since day one. Whether it be because parents don't want that gay kids living in the same tent as their precious straight as an arrow Billy, or public fears that gay people teaching children survival skills and duty to oneself in the wilderness will end up in some combination of Brokeback Mountain and Jeffrey Epstein. The Scout Oath, as well as other practices that are still around in one way or another, were created in a time of more puritanical thoughts with youth movements, looking more towards religion as a baseline within Edwardian morals. Baden Pohl would not be happy with such discrimination within his movement, as there are claims out there that he was a closeted homosexual. But this claim of discrimination is painted more towards the American BSA, as European scouting groups and America's Girl Scouts thought gay was okay thanks to Rule 4 and the Scouts Code, or they operate under some form of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, respectively. So what exactly was the issue in the eyes of both the American public and the BSA? Well, for that, we'll have to look at one notable case from the 1990s. While the BSA had practiced a policy of excluding gays since the late 70s, with any gays, closeted or not, being kicked out of camps and lodges for fear of them eating all the sausages, so to say. Even going to an extent of publishing a 1991 policy statement that read, We believe that homosexual conduct is inconsistent with the requirements in the scout oath that a scout be morally straight, and in the scout law that a scout be clean in word and deed, and that homosexuals do not provide a desirable role model for scouts. One notable case would come to the eye of the American public around the time of this statement. James Dale was a Boy Scout since he was eight excelling greatly in the program and receiving the Vigil Honor at 17. After turning 18, Dale would become an assistant scoutmaster. However, there was something he kept hidden from the scouts in his small New Jersey town. James Dale is gay. At 19, he would speak at an event hosted by Rutgers regarding issues facing gay teenagers. But fate would not be kind to him. His face would appear in a paper, along with a few quotes, and he would be outed in his community and in turn, outed to the head of his troops council. This would result in Dale's removal from the BSA after news made its way to national headquarters in Texas. Dale then decided to appeal his expulsion, working with lawyers and a legal defense fund to get back into scouting. Luckily, New Jersey did have another case going on at the time, and the defense fund helping him said that the category of places of public accommodation could be expanded to cover the BSA. Top onto that, several other cases from throughout the country occurring at the same time, and I'm going to gloss over the rest of this legal escapade and spoil it by cutting to the end. Dale's case would make it to the Supreme Court, where after a hearing in 2000, things would be looking up, with four justices in favor of his suit. At the end of the day, the verdict of 5-4 to four would decide that the BSA was a private institution and could within their rights kick out anyone who violated the views of the organization. There was backlash. In the following years, the BSA would lose financial backing from various sources upset with his ruling. While they would re-establish this statement in 2012, a proposal was floated around in 2013 to let scout chapters decide for themselves on admitting gays. It would be in 2014 that Boy Scout leadership finally caved and let gays stay scouts. However, they did keep the stipulation that they could not attain anything above it. Until changes in 2015 which allowed for gay scout masters. 
Hey, uh, just as a side note, if anyone really wants to, there's probably a good video essay or thesis paper you can do on this situation alone if it piques your interest. Now if you guessed before I said it as to why the BSA was against Dale in the first place, we'll move on to our next group. Religiously, the scouting movement was predominantly made up of Protestants and Catholics. Atheists, people who practiced a religion of no religion, as well as those God-questioners known as agnostics, garnered dissatisfaction with an organization that cites a duty to God with a capital G, as well as the country in one of their core documents. Historically, scouting was more of a Christian movement, with the Scottish Boys Brigade, who predated the camp at Brownsey by over two decades, being formed as a Christian organization. Baden Pohl incorporated some of their founding ideas, including that duty to God part of their oath. In recent history, most scouting movements have accepted people of different religious backgrounds or lack thereof. It should also be noted that the BSA and some other organizations still have God in their oath, and while everyone but the Americans has said you don't have to have God to be a scout, the BSA has barred both atheists and agnostics from joining any troop. The barrier to entry for these eager godless boys who want to learn to be a wolf or weebelow being the very same arguments made in the James Dale case. They may never be able to join a private institution that likes God and going far away from civilization into nature. Conversely, scouting has in two cases amended these discriminatory actions. Firstly, the scouting movement touts spirituality to any religious leaning in its original text. Second is that Baden Pohl himself approved the optional removal of God by organizations for the term Higher Ideal, Higher Truth back in the 1930s. It should be noted nowadays, aside from church-funded and connected groups, most of the scouting movement accepts anyone regardless of religion or lack thereof. Speaking of atheists and scouting, look everyone, it's the Talman Pioneers! Whether it be the Soviet Union, Hitler's Germany, or one of the dictatorships that popped up over the latter half of the 20th century, totalitarian regimes abolished their nation's old ways of scouting for something more in ideological acceptance. States such as Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy and Romania disbanded Boy Scout movements, replacing them with youth corps such as the infamous Hitler Youth. Originally just a reskin of the scouting movement that was banned in 1935, the Hitler Youth would become more of a force within the Wehrmacht leading up to and during the Second World War. The Third Reich would use this program as well to indoctrinate many to Nazi ideology, something we see a lot of in authoritarian regimes, and bring up a generation that would know how to wage war against those deemed undesirable in the eyes of a certain famous Austrian's deranged ideology. It should even be mentioned that baden Pohl was placed in the infamous Black Book by the Nazis, as the Reich saw the scouting movement as a form of espionage. As for Italy, Romania, and the fellow fascist states, they too were just ideological reskins of scouting, with all the good parts cut out to fill with whatever the big men in charge thought would work for the nation, such as maintaining cultural superiority and running paramilitary organizations consisting entirely of children like some African warlord. Things would be about the same for many of the communist states, with countries like the USSR abolishing scouting movements in the 1920s and other states following suit for the next half century, which is where we get the Young Pioneers. Young pioneer groups, under a lot of communist and socialist states, unsurprisingly didn't change much about the scouting movement aside from prescribing it an ideology to work off of. And that may just be the only difference we were able to find, as both the pioneer and scouting movements promoted the same ideas regarding nature, with the only big demarcation being the indoctrination of communist ideas, which is more tame compared to those Hitler youths. So the two big variations of scouting were really just scouting placed through an ideological filter. That's not too bad at a glance. Wait a minute. You see that kid in the second row? Free from the left? Video editing guy. Enhance the image. Maybe a bit out. Yeah. Scouting and militaristic ideals may go hand in hand. Not surprisingly, the early scouting movement was claimed to be similar to those dictators would replace it with, thanks in part to militarism and imperialist ideas. Baden-Pohl, while adamant that scouting was neither of these things, inadvertently helped justify it as such thanks to his military background, with arguments that it was more anti-authoritarian and democratic in its operations than perceived. The system of self-reliance and civic duty is far from the regimented drilling and group mentality we see within military culture. But the movement was seen as militaristic through its enforcement of discipline where needed and a coherent structure of ranks denoting accomplishments and in a way, status that comes with it, creating an impromptu hierarchy similar to structured ones seen in militaries. So this criticism might get cut short here. But there is usually more to this, like with any claim. Scouting militarism isn't just a British thing. I mean, 
Technically it is because it originated there, and other organizations were influenced by the Brits, but I digress. Militarism within the scouting movement can be seen in various nations throughout some of these parameters. In order of hierarchy, militaristic uniforms, and regiment-like training procedure. This claim comes more about because scouting movements were militarized under authoritarian regimes such as with the Hitler Youth or Young Pioneers, to fit more into the structure of the society. Going off this and baden polls arguments against it, I would like to put forward the idea that scouting is just a very liberal form of militarism, or just LARPing the military, like those airsoft guys do, along with pioneers and cowboys. So if militarism isn't entirely a problem, then it should just be seen as a word comparison by some critics. Imperialism, on the other hand, Imperialism through the medium of scouting, to quote one of our sources, was a more jingoistic movement to say the least. Originating from a time where the British Empire was a world player, and building upon the more American concept of scouts being akin to frontiersmen taming the wilds they ventured into. This viewpoint from critics paints the entirety of the scouting movement as a colonial tool of the British Empire, considering their influence led to the spread of such groups into their colonies. The whole idea of scouting can also be tied back to imperialist actions. If it were not for the Matabele and Boer Wars, Burnham and baden Pole would never have met, and the Cadet Corps and Mafa King would never be formed. So, scouting at least lives up to its imperialist roots in this light. It should also be noted that the scouting movements of British Africa and India would actually fight back against imperialism, using the same ideas proposed by scouting to detest imperialist laws and claim self-sufficiency from, and equal standing under, the Crown. There is also the issue of sexual abuse. With that being mentioned, now's your chance to skip over this content to the safety of the timestamp floating above my head. With that out of the way, the scouting movement is on par with the Catholic Church in the amount of sexual abuse scandals they receive. How many, you ask? A lot. To the point of Wikipedia having a separate article on the whole situation. So I'll just go over the broad strokes of a touchy subject and not dive into any specific cases unless they influence the course of scouting. Sexual assault in the context of the scouting movement is a grisly subject, given the majority of the time we're talking about pedophilia. To keep this as brief as I can to spare us all the details through several cases dating back to at least the 70s, there has been an abuse of power from elders, be they scoutmasters, assistants, or rudders, in committing sexual acts of children and teenagers. Across the Anglosphere, cases popped up even through the 2020s of misconduct. It's been an issue for so long that back in the 80s, the BSA initiated the Youth Protection Program with similar methods of protecting children popping up in other nations. I don't really want to dig into this kind of stuff. It's disturbing, and I'm not a Minecraft YouTuber drama channel or one of those true crime channels. So, we'll cut this segment short here, and there will be a separate section in our sources document for this atrocity. And that's the scouting movement. From the wild frontiers of South Africa, to the campfires and trails of woodlands the world over. The image of youths and militaristic garb learning about nature and how to make their world more livable and survivable with civic education. For controversy and tyranny, scouting has prevailed. I only hope it continues that way in pursuit of the ideals that founded them in 1907. In the words of Robert Baden-Pole, try and leave this world a little better than you found it. <laughs>